All right, well, good morning. Let's, um, let's go ahead and open up the Word of God. We'll, we're going to begin in Mark 6, uh, verse 45, which will be a continuation uh, in the book of Mark where we've been. Uh, so Mark chapter 6, verse 45, and we'll, we'll go down through verse 56 today uh, and, and uh, consider that. So it's a, a continuation of many of the miracles that Jesus did while he walked the earth, that that validated his message and verified who he was. So Mark chapter 6, verse 45. It says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored to shore. (coughs) And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring their sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or the countryside, They laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again so much for your your word, for these uh, gospel accounts of you as you were here, the miracles that you performed while you were here, dear Lord. uh, They are just that miracles, And, and although we know that the miracles themselves did not eternally save anyone. We know the purposes of them. So as we study them today, dear Lord, just, just let us place ourselves there uh, at this time um, and uh, consider uh, what they saw and how this all took place. And may it just uh, increase our, our knowledge and our love for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus, while he walked the earth, performed many miracles. We know that. And sometimes we, I know I do, you think about it and they they become kind of mundane. Well, I mean, Jesus, he walked on water. I mean, what's the big deal? He created food, you know. And you you lose the sense of how (laughs) miraculous these miracles are. And so I think as we we go through them, it it, it really behooves us to, um, to put yourself there to consider what you would do. If you were one of those that was in the crowd in the feeding of the loaves and you witnessed this, you know, what would you be thinking? What would you be thinking? Um, You know, we all have this mental picture and we've seen movies that maybe tried to depict how that took place and Ray said something about last week, you know, you can't really, you know, did he take one and it turned into 50 on that row or did it just, every time they took one, it, you know, I mean, you just can't, picture how that happened because it's it's miraculous it's something that that we can't explain um, but we know that he made uh, that he that he did many many miracles and the purpose of those in, in John uh, 20 verse 30 and 31 on your scripture references here uh, John tells us this at the end of his gospel account he said now Jesus did many other signs signs would be those miraculous things that pointed to who he was in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, by believing you may have life in his name. And in the next chapter he says, Now there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So he did many, many miracles, only some of which are recorded for us in the gospel. But if that's the case, then everywhere he went, basically he he did a miracle. As it says in the end of our our little, uh, in verses 53 through 56, everywhere he went, they came by. They touched him. They laid their 
Uh, they laid their ill and their sick on the bed so they just touched the garment. So it was a, an explosion of healing. But the purpose of the miracles and the healing were not to heal because everyone who healed eventually died again. Um, everyone that ate the food that he created eventually died again. Everyone he drove the demon out eventually died again. Um, and everyone that liked his disciples when he saved them when by calming the sea, you know, they eventually will die again. So the purpose was not just that, but it, it was to validate who he was. It was to uh, show people uh, that he was the son of God. And, and what's interesting enough, we could say right now from this thing, you know, man, if I was there, <laughs> he's the son of God, right? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Until the Holy Spirit came and made that <laughs> evident in your heart, you'd be just like them. You would be, you would be a fallen man, fallen nature. You, you would explain that. You would look at that miracle created food, and, and you'd be like the people in the, uh, that John describes. They, after Jesus dismissed them after the feeding, they came back the next day. They wanted breakfast. You know, they, it, it was something about themselves. There's something for their need. But they also, it wasn't just to validate them, but it also demonstrated his compassion. It demonstrated that attribute of God that, uh, that we all know so well. And, and, and it's written down for us also uh, for the purpose of, of sanctifying us, for, for telling us, you know, how do, we, how do we become more like Christ unless we know what Christ did and who he was and what he did. So, so they're written down for our purpose as well, too. So we need to really... When we read these set passages, not just kind of skim through them, but really meditate on how it really was when Christ did uh, that particular miracle. Now, uh, I heard uh, Jason just a minute ago when, when he was uh, saying some of, these, some of these songs that we sing, bec we sing them over and over again. They come you know, kind of familiar to us and stuff like that. But, you know, each miracle that he did, <laughs> he did one time. You know, it didn't be, you know, you saw it, you may, have, you may have seen one of them, but you may have seen, not seen another one. So it would have been something that, you know, uh, that that may be the only time you saw it. So you, you need to, to consider that. So w these are written down for us, for us to know who he was. So the crowds, again, like I said, they, they saw it not really for what it was, but they really, everything that, that Christ did for them fulfilled the need in them. He created food to feed them. He healed their sickness. And so he looked upon it as something that Christ was doing for them. So, so Christ became really popular. As a matter of fact, this, in this episode here, this is kind of the height of his popularity. It's about the second year of his ministry through Galilee. Uh, the feeding took place about the time of Passover, which means that a year from now, he'd be in Jerusalem and be crucified. So this was his last kind of swing through Galilee, but but immediately before the feeding, as you recall, he had given his 12 uh, the um, abilities to heal, to drive out demons, to raise the dead, and to teach. And you remember he sent them out now. So now instead of just Jesus teaching, which is everything up till then, it was him teaching, one person, uh, he exponentially spread that. And so there had been an explosion of healings and, and the teachings and everything like that. And and, and, but the crowds would see it again as a physical thing. You know, uh, you healed me. Thanks. I'm great now. You know, you fed me. I, I feel full. I, I'm going to come back tomorrow. You can do it again. So it was the height of his popularity. And, and you remember the, uh, the, uh, right before the feeding again, the 12 disciples came back to Jesus after they had uh, done that. Uh, and Jesus said, well, let's go and rest a little bit. We're going to go um <coughs> to a desolate place. Um, it's near the town of Bethsaida, which is where they went. Um, Bethsaida just is a, means house of fish, so it would have been on the seashore. But it was near that town. It wasn't in a town. It was a desolate place, but again, springtime, it was a, 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 a beautiful place, green grass and everything like that. But that's where the feeding took place, was near this town of Bethsaida in a desolate place. Bethsaida would have been a small town, okay, very small town. And... So what's the significance of Bethsaida? Why, why is that important? Do you know, remember who was who from Bethsaida? You all remember? Who? I, 
You know, I can't hear you. That's I need one of these for you. <laughs> Mary, Martha, and John. Maybe so, but which of the disciples were from Bethsaida? Peter, Andrew, Philip. You remember John 1, 4? It said that Bethsaida was the hometown of Peter and Andrew, and Philip was from Bethsaida, possibly Nathaniel from Bethsaida, again, a fishing village. Now, they had taken up uh, their uh, operations over in Capernaum because it was a bigger place, but they are from Bethsaida, this little town over there where this feeding of 5,000, probably much more than 5,000, because remember, it's 5,000 men plus women and children. Um, and if any of the men were so like some of the men in, in this congregation, one man is attached to maybe 10 other children <laughs> or nine other children or five other children, however many there are, but that would exponentially increase how many he fed. But it would have been a, a, a multitude of people, and, and by number-wise, it was kind of the most uh, um, the most numbers that he performed a miracle, the, the biggest crowd, I guess we'll say, the most people witnessed this miracle of all the ones that he did. Um, and so it was a, uh, a significant miracle, like they all were, but it was a massive display of his created power. And so what uh, Bethsaida, uh, being a small town, near there, okay, but um, most of these people in Bethsaida would have had to witness that. They would have come because the, the frenzy for Jesus was, was, uh, was, was uh, overwhelming at that time, so everyone wanted to come see. So they would have witnessed this, but then it tells us in Luke 10, 13, Jesus says this, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now that's important because Tyre and Sidon were, were two very wicked cities uh, up there, part of the Phoenician thing up on the, the Mediterranean coast. And they were so wicked that God destroyed them in the Old Testament. Okay, But what he's saying here is if these miracles had been done in them, God, knowing all the potential ramifications of everything, God in his providence, he said they would have repented. That wicked city would have repented. And so it says in verse 14, but it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. So Bethsaida, Tyre and Sidon were an outwardly wicked, wicked town. They were destroyed by God. Bethsaida was an outwardly righteous town a self-righteous town with Jesus. And so he's saying, you know, it, it, in the judgment, because you rejected him, you're going to burn a little hotter. I mean, you're gonna, it's going to be worse for you because of that. Um, and that is, that's important because to whom much is given, much is expected. So they, they have been exposed to it, and we, we, we understand that before. The more you learn, the more is expected of you. All right. So Bethsaida is this town, again, it's probably in the north east part of the Sea of Galilee. And so uh, that's where they, they fed the 5,000. Uh, and again, this is at the, uh, uh, at the pinnacle, I guess, of Jesus' popularity on earth, okay, because, uh, of the, uh, because of the miracles he's performed, but also because of this, the expectations of the Messiah. Okay, you know, every, all the Jewish nation had, in the Old Testament read there's going to be a Messiah. He's going to restore Israel to its, to its uh, kingship and its dominance in the world. And, you know, prior to John the Baptist, it had been 400 years since a prophet had, had spoken. And so uh, John comes, foretells of Jesus. Jesus comes and starts doing all these things <laughs> that to them are, you know, obviously... Uh, and to all of us, they're obviously supernatural. They, no one else could have done that. So they're asking themselves, could this be him? Could this be the Messiah? Um, so there was a, somewhat of a messianic frenzy at this time. And so, so and they're thinking, you know, here, here's this guy who's driving out demons. He's, he's, he's curing every disease. He's, he's raising people from the dead. He's creating food. He's doing this by supernatural means. You know, he could be the guy. And so in John 6.15, at the end of the feeding, uh, and that's in the parallel passage that, that comes, at the end of the feeding, Jesus perceived that they were going to make him king and take him by force to make him king. 
because he's got all the, I mean, that's kind of foolish when you think about the power he's got, but they wanted to make him king. They wanted to institute him then as the Messiah that had been prophesied because he's got all these powers. So he can take these powers. He can, uh, um, he can get himself a, an army. It wouldn't take many people to overthrow Rome, you know, because he's got these powers and restore Israel to where, it, uh, where uh, it's prophesied that he will be. So that was the, the uh, mindset of most of the people at this particular time. But what about the apostles? Who, who did they think Jesus was? What, who did they think the Messiah was going to be? They kind of had the same messianic expectation. He's going to come now. He's going to take over. He's going to uh, rule like he was. And so their expectations were just like the crowds. And so, and they had seen many, many miracles, right? And they had heard his teachings. Because, but in, in Mark 6.52, our verse today, look at the, the very last one. Or no, Mark 6.52. The Holy Spirit tells Mark that after this episode of Jesus walking on the water, Mark tells us this. For they, speaking of the, dis- the apostles, they were in the boat, They did not understand about the loaves, meaning the the feeding that he had just done. Okay, this happened right after he fed all these people. Uh, They did not understand about the loaves, okay, but their hearts were hardened. So they didn't really understand what Jesus was trying to teach them about creating this food. Jesus, they didn't really understand the purpose of these miracles because their hearts were still hardened. Now they had a... a, uh, a modesty faith, but but listen to this Matthew Henry, and sometimes we 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 think the same thing when we read things, and, and Jesus says something, and the apostles think just the opposite or something. Matthew Henry describes the apostles in this thing as strangely stupid <laughs> and unthinking. You know, and, and we can see that we can look back and said, you know, so they witnessed all these things, and they're they don't get it still. They don't get it still. Okay. But seemingly, after this miracle that we're going to talk about today, Jesus walking on the water, if you follow the, uh, the uh, temporal, what happens next, after he walks on water, they go to the region of Gennesaret. He goes up to Capernaum. He preaches in the synagogue in Capernaum, the preaching he's the bread of life. Okay, And you remember after he preaches that, where he says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood to be part of me. You know, they all said, man, this is hard teaching. You know, who can get this? Many of them then turned and walked no more with him. But immediately after that happened, he turns to the 12. And he says down there, I think it's on your, no, it's on my notes. In John 6, 67, he says, so Jesus then said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So they seem to have had some type of heart change, a, a changing that, that after, after this miracle, after that sermon, that, that, that maybe they understood it a little better. That, that's the best I can say about that. So let's go then to that miracle, okay? Um, as it's described in Mark chapter 6, 45. So... Um, three things. I had to think of some long words and three things to get out of this particular passage. Okay, and these are words you don't have to look up because you, you kind of know them. Okay, number one, uh, in verses forty-five through forty-six, we see the intercessory prayer of Jesus. You know what that means. Number two, in the next uh, verses forty-seven through fifty-two, we see the providential intercession of Jesus, providentially interceding in the events of man uh, for a purpose. And then number three, the indefatigable, that's a good word, compassion of Jesus, indefatigable. He never is tireless. He, he never gets tired of it, right? Good words, right? I was just trying to catch up with you, basically. All right, so in, in verse 45, uh, we come here. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. So in verse 45, it says immediately he made his disciples. He made them uh, get into the boat. And that Greek word is anakatsko, which means to force or compel. He had to make them get into the boat. Now, why would he have to do that? Um, I mean, couldn't he just tell them? Um, er, or why, 
you know, didn't they want to go somewhere? I mean, you know, why did he have to compel them? Well, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, number one is, uh, you know, he had just created this food. He was at the height of his popularity. They, the crowd loved him. They wanted to make him king. You know, they had just gotten there. Why can't we just hang around here for a little while? You know, Jesus said, nope, time to go. Okay, he made them go. You know, they were... Like us, they again, their, their hearts were hardened, he said, a, even after the loaves, so they didn't get it yet, so they made them go. I got something else for you coming up. Um, that's one, one kind of idea as well. Uh, and, in, and in John 6, uh, the uh, parallel passage in John six seventeen, <coughs> it says that they uh, were going, their destination was Capernaum. So Mark says he told them to go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. So, which one's right? I mean, h- how do you how do you reconcile those things? A lot of times we see things in the scripture that that one writer will say this, the other writer will say that, and they seem to be conflicting. Um, a couple of scholarly ideas about that. One is that that there was a uh, another town called Bethsaida. <laughs> but there's no archaeological evidence for that. Probably the best idea is this, is you say, okay, go get in the boat. They're camped somewhere down in the southeast of Bethsaida. So he say, go to Capernaum, go towards Bethsaida. So go kind of along the seashore, I guess is what he's saying. Because that word to Bethsaida, to could mean toward, in that general direction. So they're going west, okay, towards Capernaum. Um, and then Jesus remained to dismiss the crowd. The crowd would have been obviously happy, I guess you could say, uh, uh, seeing what just happened. Uh, he dismissed them, uh, but they didn't go far because John tells us that, that many of them came back the next morning, okay, to that same area where the loaves were, uh, obviously wanting another meal. Uh, and then in verse 46, he went up to the mountain to pray. So um, uh, in Matthew 14 tells us he's by himself. Um, and often Jesus did this. Often Jesus went to get away by himself to commune with the Father, to pray to the Father, to ask for strength from the Father. You remember in the garden he said, you know, if, if by your will take this cup from me, but not your will. He's always praying for the Father in communion, understanding the Father's will and, and carrying that out. So, so he did this many times. And possibly at this particular time of Jesus with the the, the height of his uh, popularity and them wanting to make him king, this might be a temptation to Jesus uh, uh, to, again, bypass the cross. It would be similar to when Satan said, look, you know, all the kingdoms, I'll give them to you if you'll just worship me. You know, you don't need to do the cross. That's not right. Did God really say that? <laughs> um, that's, I mean, kind of what, uh, what could have been going on. So he could have been praying for strength because we know in Hebrews that, that he was, Tempted in all ways as we are, but is without sin. So we know that he was tempted while he was here on earth. But I think in the context and what what comes after it in the gospel account is he was interceding, being intercessory prayer for his disciples, uh, for his disciples and for faith, because you know Mark tells us that even after the loaves, their hearts their hearts were hardened and they didn't understand. And Jesus did this many times, praying for he. Because he providentially knows everything, uh, he knows what's next. He knows what we need, and he provides that maybe in ways we don't want to have provided to us, but in a way that, that, uh, uh, that is uh, his way that he knows is going to glorify him and, and for our good. So, so he had done this many times, and he had done this uh, in uh, before Peter denied him. You know, he said that in Luke twenty two thirty one, He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, I love that, uh, strengthen your brothers. So he prayed for their faith. He, he, he was praying, uh, I, I would say he was praying. It doesn't tell specifically what he's praying for, but we can almost guess that that's part of what he was praying for. And you know that, that, uh, that great priestly, high priestly prayer in John 17, um, uh, he, he speaks to the Father in 17.9, he said, I am praying for them, speaking of the disciples, I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me, 
for they are yours. And I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. Um, sanctify them in your truth. Um, I do not ask for these only, and I love this in verse 20, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which would be all of us. Okay, so he's praying for us. He's interceding for us as well. And Paul tells us in Romans 8 that, that uh, down there, Christ Jesus, the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, he's interceding for us. He's currently doing that as well. So Jesus is the great intercessor for us at the right hand of God still. So he was, um, he was up there praying on the mountain, and then we go to, uh, in verse 47, um, and when evening came, the boat was out in the sea, and he was alone on the land. And so now we're going to get into this providential intercession of Jesus. So let me ask you this question. Does God providentially intercede in the affairs of men, physical things, um, or is he like most of the founding fathers of our country that were deists that said God created the world and just kind of sat back and see what's going to happen? All ah, right, very good. I think you all know that. We know that's the way it is, and, and, he, and he intervenes especially for those that are his, right? I mean, the, the, the children of Israel, um, you know, how did he intervene for them? I mean, certain miraculous things. Would they have ever, the children of Israel, ever gotten out of Egypt if God hadn't started putting these plagues out, if God hadn't pretty much, you know, done what he did? No, he intercedes physically to... Um, to accomplish his purposes and his goals. Um, and sometimes those intercession things are by affliction. Okay, he, can, uh, he, can, he creates affliction for the purpose of, for, his good, for, for our good and his glory in those who love him. Okay, so he can do it either by good, as in driving uh, by uh, the people coming out of Egypt, um, or by way of affliction. I mean, you know, um, no, nope, I'm not there yet. Uh, we know Job, um, Egypt. We know the storm that he created before that, that, uh, uh, that he calmed as well. Um, but it's always for his glory and for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. So if you look at this miracle and put yourself there in the boat with the, with the uh, disciples, uh, in verse 47, it says, When evening came, the boat was out of sea, and he was alone, Jesus was alone on land. And he saw, he, Jesus, saw they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. So it was, when did they get in the boat? They got in the boat right after the feeding. Okay, right after he created food, they fed them, he told them to get in the boat and go. Okay, so they're in the boat uh, at evening. Uh, He's alone now praying for them. Uh, Matthew tells us in his account, and, and by the way, reading the parallel accounts really fills in gaps and gives you a better idea of everything that happened. So I encourage you to kind of do that and compare them. Matthew tells us that, that they were a long way from land. They were beaten by the waves. The wind was against them. Uh, John tells us that the sea became rough. The wind was blowing and was, was beating against the boat. So it was a storm again. And they've been out there since the evening, and it wasn't until when? The fourth watch of the night that Jesus comes. So evening is the fourth watch of the night. Okay, I guess you maybe you understand it. The Romans had four watches of the night. The first watch was from evening 6 to about 9 p.m. The second watch from 9 to 12, third, 12 to 3. The fourth from 3 till morning, so about 6. So now the Jesus doesn't come to them. the fourth watch of the night. They're a long way out. This trip that they should have taken, they should have been there by now, okay? But that wasn't happening because uh, the wind was against them. They were making headway painfully. The waves were beating on them. Uh, and these were experienced fishermen. I mean, they, you know, they, this is what they'd done all their life. They were used to these storms and stuff like that. But then in verse 48, he says he saw that they were making headway painfully. Now, don't miss that word saw. I mean, He's a, they're a long way off. There's a storm. Did he physically see them? I mean, yeah, he was up on a mountain, but you know, I think this more is evidence of his 
a mission, that he, he knew they were there. He knew that the storm was, was beating against the boat. He knew that they were in trouble, okay? He knew they were in trouble because <laughs> he created that trouble for them. He created that storm for them for a purpose. Um, so we know that, that, that Jesus is omniscient. I think I put a couple of uh, verses down there. Proverbs tell us that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Job tells us, does he not see my ways and number all my steps? Well, of course he does. Uh, Second Chronicles, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards them. So to those who are his, he sees everything. He sees everything anyway, but to those who are him, he gives strong support. In Hebrews, no creature is hidden from his sight. Um, Psalm 139, uh, the psalmist says here, where shall I go from your spirit? In other words, where shall I go to, to get away from your spirit? This is a rhetorical question. Where do I go to get away from God? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Uh, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, <laughs> you're there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell to the uttermost part of the seas, in other words, if I just take out and go as far as I can to sea, even there you shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. So we know that God is omniscient. God, God, God was omniscient here. He was seeing them. He saw the danger they were in, and <coughs> uh, every mile was painful. Waves were on the sea. They had to be fatigued and tired by the fourth watch of the night, so they'd been doing it nine, ten hours. You know, it shouldn't have taken them but a few hours to get to where they needed to go. Um, I wonder if they were wondering... Remember last time they were in this predicament, Jesus was in the boat back there with them, and they just kind of woke him up a little bit. And I wonder if they were wishing he was back there at this time. Probably was, I would think. Um, so they they were they were in trouble basically. Uh, John tells us they were they had, they were at least three to four miles off uh, offshore. They were tired, fearful, and uh, they're probably thinking to themselves, you know, why did he make us come out here? I mean, we were doing really good when he was making that food, and everybody loved us back on land. So, but he made us come out here. Hmm. Why did he tell us to go? So then about the fourth watch of night, he comes walking on the sea. Okay, now, we all have a mental picture of what that might be. But again, you put yourself there. I mean, he can, it, you know, you think he's walking on this glass runway or something, and the wind's blowing, and his robes are thing, but... You know, I don't think that the disciples were expecting him. Uh, they may have been praying at this time, uh, but I don't think they were expecting him. And then it says, he meant to pass them by. Now, you can, what does that mean, meant to pass them by? Well, I mean, I think we, we don't make too much. It, it really probably literally means to come alongside him. He didn't, he wasn't going to pass them by and say, hey, guys, how you doing? You know, I'll meet you over there. That's not what it means. It means to come alongside which is what he did. He came alongside, right? Um, and in verse 49, it says, And when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. Okay, ghost, phantasma, phantom, a specter, something evil, typically something that comes out at night that's evil. And remember, it's still night. So they, they cried out. They're terrified. Uh, John said they were frightened. Matt said they were ter Matthew says they were terrified. Um, and like I said, I doubt they expected Jesus, so this would have been something that uh, scared them, I would think. But he uh, says, but immediately, that's M Mark's favorite word, but immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Take heart. That's one of his, uh, many times he uses that saying to, to tell his people, depend on me, even when everything else looks terrible, but depend on me in all, in all circumstances. That's what you need to do. And that's essentially what he's telling his disciples there right now. And, and a couple of the, uh, I think that word is used, take heart. Matthew 9, 2, when, he, uh, when they brought him the paralytic that was lying on the bed, he said, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And in 22, he said to the, the, the um, woman who had the discharge of blood for 12 years, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And in John 16, 33, to all of us, he says, uh, in the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Okay. In Acts 23, he came to Paul uh, when he was arrested in Jerusalem and said, take courage. They're saying 
same Greek phrase, hey, courage, uh, for you have to get to Rome. Nothing's going to happen to you here, okay? You have to get to Rome. So it's a phrase that he uses a lot. And then he says, it is I, uh, which again, literally is, is I am, okay? It, it, it's the same uh, thing that uh, in Exodus he said, uh, I am who I am, right? So what he's doing again, not only is he saying, you know, you know, I'm not a ghost and a specter. It's, it's me. You know, Jesus, in his earthly ministry, not only revealed who he was through his miracles and everything, but he claimed who he was through his words. He spoke this often. I am. Okay, before Abraham was, I am. I think that's one I wrote down there. Yeah, truly for uh, to the to those Jews that were uh, uh, that he was having an interchange with. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And then Father and I are one. Okay, so the Jews knew exactly who he said he was claiming to be. They knew that that's who he claimed to be, but they didn't believe him. Their heart was hardened. They, as a matter of fact, uh, said that, that the only way he could do what he did is through the power of Satan. So they, that, and that was the, uh, their uh, accusation against them that uh, in God's providence brought upon the crucifixion, etc., uh, but he always demonstrated uh, that deity. You know, uh, in um, John 10:33, uh, the Jews answered him, "It's not for the good work that we're going to stone you." I mean, no, they liked the good works he was doing. I mean, they were good works. I mean, he was healing people. He was, you know, creating food. He was doing everything like that. So it's not for that that we're going to stone you. But you know, you're claiming to be God, and you're not God. Okay, that that's that was their. They're saying, and their, and their party line was that he did what he did through the, uh, through the power of Satan. So Jesus comes alongside the boat here, um, got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. All right? Okay. Similar to what had happened before. Okay? But what's kind of missing in Mark's account is in Matthew chapter 14. Why don't you just turn there real quick? And that's what Peter did, how Peter responded to this. So Matthew chapter 14 and verse 28. And this is the, the parallel account, only Matthew adds this, okay, which Mark leaves out. He says, and Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, which he just said it was, okay, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So Peter's response could have been representative, really, of all the, the apostles. They, they were in the same, I was going to say they're in the same boat, but they were in the same boat, but they're in the same mindset, I guess. Uh, and Jesus' rebuke to them would have been fitting for all of them as well. Um, you know, he said that same rebuke when he calmed the storm in the previous thing. He says, oh, you of little faith, or why did, uh, you know, where, is you fa where is your faith, basically? But I think the idea here is it shows Jesus' willingness, his compassion, his willingness to, um, to help those um, that in their time of need, even in their weakness, he's going to help you. And that's what he did for Peter there as well. But it demonstrated that they weren't, that it's not the amount of faith you have, it's the faith that's granted to you. And Christ will always be there to strengthen your faith if you ask him to as well. Um, in Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So in 51, the wind ceased. In verse 51, the wind ceased. Back to Mark now. Um, says they were astonished. John said they were glad. I'm sure they were. But Matthew tells us in 1433, right after this, that they worshipped him. Okay, they weren't just happy and excited, but now they worshipped him. They said, you are the son of God. So one minute, the, you know, they're battling the waves. The next minute, it's perfectly calm. Uh, certainly, they'd seen this before. Okay, one time Jesus spoke and calmed the wave. This time, he steps in the boat, and it happens. Okay, nonetheless, the purpose of that storm now was over. Okay, the purpose of that storm was now over. And so to demonstrate his power and to increase the faith in his 
apostles there. And this, this miracle, unlike many of the others, or unlike many others, and also like many others, was just the apostles' talk. This was not a big crowd and many people. This was something specifically for them. Okay, we know that Jesus created the storm. We know Jesus calmed the storm. There was a purpose in it, because there is a purpose in everything. And so the purpose was to demonstrate who he was. And so now they understood, seemingly, that they were in the presence of the creator. Um, we can read down there, Job, but we run out of time, so we'll skip that. Uh, but basically, worship should have been the proper response to all the miracles that they saw, right? I mean, that, that's what they were, they were designed to demonstrate his power, and they should have responded really this way earlier. But, um, but remember, after, the, after he calmed the storm the first time, they said, who is this guy? I mean, even the wind and the song, you know, obeying him. So they didn't understand it, right? They didn't uh, understand it at that time. Uh, but now it seems like they did, that he was the son of God. Um, in verse 52, then, uh, which is excellent, uh, the Holy Spirit kind of intercedes us right here to kind of to make us understood, understand kind of where they were right before this, um, this miracle and then kind of where they were after. So in 52, it tells us that in spite of the miracle of the loaves, their hearts were hardened. So they had seen a tremendous miracle, but their hearts were still hardened, and they, they didn't understand. They didn't understand the Creator. They were spiritually dull. They were surprisingly stupid and unthinking. They were just like us, okay? We'll put it that way. Um, or, you know, maybe they were so caught up in all these messianic expectations that all they could see was Jesus is going to make the kingdom. I'm going to be at his right hand. I'm going to be at his left hand. You know, we're going to rule. They had these expectations that, that the people had. So it seemingly they went from maybe a little bit of faith to a greater faith. Because as we mentioned earlier, the next day after they, they got to land in Gennesaret, they walked up to Capernaum. He, he preached a sermon in, um, uh, in the synagogue there in Capernaum. And when many, many other of his followers and disciples left because he was saying some tough things, they seemed to understand, you're the Holy One of God. So this, this miracle, it wasn't any greater than any of his other miracles. It was designed specifically for these disciples at this time to increase their faith. And seemingly that's what it did uh, because at that time they seemed to understand uh, better than they did the day before, I guess, after the miracle of the loaves. So, so we're out of time. We'll we'll get to point number three next week and um, uh, go from there. Does anybody else want to say anything? You know, I'm down here so that I can hear you better, and um, I know you can hear me whether I'm here or there. But uh, so I, I maybe we'll get a little more kind of dialogue going. I'll try to incorporate that in there. So, okay. Anybody else want to say anything? No. All right. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much for um, just the written word that you have given us. And although we weren't physically there, uh, we should, by the power of the Spirit, we can meditate and place ourselves during these, these miraculous things that, that speak of who you are, Lord. And we, we pray that it, will, it won't generate our faith in us, but it will increase our faith in you and to sanctify us. So give us that, that strength and that wisdom. Lead us as we, um, as we read your word. Uh, we ask this in your son's name. Amen.